Uh, thank you all for being here for this third talk right before lunch. Um, just a quick note, after this, uh, after this talk, there'll be lunch in the hallways outside. So please take some time to enjoy something to eat and take a break um, and mingle with all of the attendees and speakers here today. So uh, for this talk, we have uh, Gil, um, who will be starting us out with a, a talk on IBIS. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning still, everyone. Nice to see you all. Thanks for coming. Um, uh, my name is uh, Gil Forsyth. I work at Voltron Data. Uh, that's some of the places you can find me on the internet. Uh, my colleague, Philip Cloud, will be presenting in the second half. Uh, that's where you can find him on the internet. Um, so um, I'm here today to talk to you about IBIS, which is a, a lightweight Python library for data wrangling. Uh, but before I get started about IBIS, I just want to do a quick show of hands. Um, oh, sorry. These are the people who work on IBIS. Um, has anyone ever had to translate some data analysis from Pandas to PySpark? Or maybe you like prototyped something in Pandas and you threw it over the wall to a data engineer, or you were thrown at because you're a data engineer, um, or you used Parquet as a cross-language serialization format. Great, lots of hands. That's what I like to see. So um, I think that one of the reasons for that is that the Pi data stack, and everyone's favorite slide, thanks, Jake, um, uh, makes two uh, core assumptions in most but not all projects. And one is that data is local, and the second is that data fits in memory. Um, and this has uh, a couple of implications. But so like, what does that look like? So let's imagine that in a local execution sort of style, you have, a, you have your local, here it's pandas, this is just representative, and your remote is Postgres, right? These are the 800-pound the gorillas and or pandas in the room. Um, so you connect to your engine, you say, hey, I think you've got a table called ratings. Uh, you slurp that entire table up into memory on your laptop, and then you load the data, you parse the types, you perform some analysis. Um, and this is fine until it's not, right? Because if you're out of memory, then you're out of luck, right? This only works for data up to a certain size. Um, and also, um, one thing that's sort of strange about this, or that could be better, is that you're treating, in this case, Postgres, as a data store. Um, and it is, like, in one sense, but also you're leaving a lot on the table. Like, it can do a lot more than just, like, give you data to load into pandas. Um, and this is a pattern that shows up a lot in the Pi data stack, especially in relation to the enterprise. Um, and that's because I think the enterprise has what I call, like, a Pi data translation problem. Um, and no one wants to write things twice. It's unpleasant. But by and large, the tool chain on your laptop is different from what's going to be uh, run in prod at the end of the day. You just have different things installed there. Um, and like, the things that are in these boxes are, again, representative. And some of them can be in either box. And this is all a little hand wavy. But there's usually like, not a perfect match between what you have on your laptop and what it's going to run against. Um, and also, like, the things that it's run against might not be up to you. Uh, so how do you bridge this divide, though? Um, one of the tools that nominally promises to remove that hurdle is SQL. So we need to talk about SQL. Uh, you know, the structured query language, it's been around for a long time. You've probably written at least a little bit of it. Uh, but most importantly, um, it is absolutely everywhere. And uh, it's usually between you and the data. Uh, but SQL is uh, not without its problems. So some pros and cons, always good when all your pros have caveats. But um, so pros, it's standardized, but it's, it's not, and I'll talk about that. Um, and it is concise. I will give it that. Uh, on the con side, it's effectively untestable. Um, that conciseness sometimes makes it inscrutable. Uh, and also, it fails at runtime, right? Like, you, you know, you put, your, you put your SQL string in, and it's either going to work or it's not. Um, but does it solve the translation problem? Let's see. You, know, you have remote execution. Let's say now in your local you have some text editor. Uh, you conjure a query somehow. I don't know. You have to know a lot. You connect to your engine. You send the query over. It executes it. You get the results back. Right? Um, so the claim is you just write SQL. You always execute SQL. There's no divide between uh, your laptop and prod anymore. That's awesome. Um, this, I would say, is not a super tight loop when you're doing exploratory work. Um, and also, there's not necessarily the case that you're allowed to just execute your like, exploratory queries against prod. That sometimes is sort of frowned upon, right? So maybe what you do instead is you like, 
get a local sample, right? Maybe in like an analytical form. So now on your, on your local, you have maybe like say SQLite. Now you do have a nice little tight loop, right? You can kind of like, you know, you can develop your query against the SQLite sample, you get it to where you want. Now you actually have, you know, something to base this on. You have this query, you send it over to the, the big engine, uh, it executes it, you get your results back, right? Problem solved, we did it, talk's over. Um, so it's a problem except because SQL also has a translation problem. There is a SQL standard, but, well, I mean, standards are great, but there's also a reason why there's always 15 of them, right? Um, so imagine just this simple task. You have the data on the left, it's been ingested, all is strings, great way to deal with like nulls and other things. And you want to though now, kind of get it into the appropriate form, right? We've got something that clearly should be a float, another column that should clearly be integers. So if you do that between just, just and representative examples, SQLite and Postgres, this is a very straightforward task, and this is not the same, right? It's close to being the same, uh, but it's not. So for the simple task, things have already diverged. Um, and this is not an insurmountable divide. We'll talk about that very shortly. Um, but you want to avoid probably maintaining two versions of the same thing, because they're going to diverge, you're going to edit one and not the other one, it's going to go badly. Uh, SQL also has a parameterization problem, I would say, like are you running one big query or are you running like a hundred smaller queries? Um, like do you want to choose the top ten movies, uh, but you also want them to match certain keywords or something? Um, how are you looping over those? How are you executing them? You need now like an extra thing that runs your SQL queries for you. Um, and again, it fails at runtime. So if like 99 of those queries are great, but like the hundredth has like a null or a none by accident, then it's gonna fall over then. There's also, this isn't a problem. This is just, uh, we, like, we like Python, we're here at PyData, we wanna write it in Python. Uh, and then there's the final issue with using SQL, which is that I don't wanna write SQL. Um, like, SQL can be concise, but some operations are really hard to spell, and you probably don't want to learn how to do recursive common table expressions. Like, if you do, that's great. I'm not here to, like, shame anyone, just not my thing. So what is a solution? Presented with a translation problem, parameterization problem, we want to use Python, we don't want to write a, write a bunch of SQL. So some people presented with a problem think, I know, I'll generate strings. We've all done this, it's okay. So recall, this is our simple example, we wanna, we wanna unify these two things. And this is, this is okay, right? This starts off pretty simple. You know, you, you write most of it, you know the only thing that's really gonna change is that the D types have different names, so maybe you write like a helpful mapping or a little function, you give it the dialect of SQL you're targeting, and you're good. But remember, you've got a translation problem so function names are gonna differ between different SQL execution engines. Uh, the order of arguments to a function might differ, like is log of x to base b, does it, is it b comma x or is it x comma b? There's no right answer to that, you, we just don't know. Um, you wanna take advantage of optimized functions when you can, because you don't wanna leave performance on the table. Output formats vary wildly. I haven't even mentioned date time, and I'm not going to, or like null behavior, like, but there's a whole other bucket of stuff, right? You have the parameterization problem. It's hard to do. If it was straightforward, it would already be done. It's not. It's really hard. Um, you have what I call outside factors. You may have heard some of these things in the past. Um, and so that, like, this is fine. This simple query we started with, this is fine. And like, realistically, this is just casting some data. So what do we want to do? We want to like join it to the actual titles of the movies. This is IMDb data. So of course, you join it to the movie titles. This is also fine. This is totally reasonable. And then someone says, you know, would it be really awesome if we could also like bring in some different ratings? But now you need to parameterize the column you're joining because maybe it's not tconst, maybe it's something else with this other ratings data set. And then someone says, we really need to parameterize the like words that are in the titles of the movies. And now you're doing string searching inside of a, a SQL query and you're using char index for that. Uh, but maybe like your engine doesn't have char index, so then you have to have like an extra thing that's like, well, does it support char index? And if it does, use that. But if it doesn't, then use like. And there's at least three bugs in here. I know because I tried to run it. Um, like, and also like movie titles have a lot of quotes in them. So like, how are you escaping? It, it's a it's a mess. So this is horrible. Uh, I found this yesterday, and it really spoke to me deeply. Um, so you might say, very reasonably, gross, I'm not gonna use SQL, and I support you. But 
it's everywhere. It's not always up to us. It's between us and the data. Uh, and another thing that I overlooked when I was learning SQL and other things is that uh, like computer scientists have been working on these execution engines for the last 50 years. They're really fast. They're really, really good. And if you don't use them, you're leaving a lot of performance on the table. So where does that leave us? Like SQL standards are not standard. It can be convoluted. String generation is a bad idea. Uh, but we still want to write our analytics in Python. So what if, instead of generating strings, you write concise Python code that type checks and then eventually generates strings? And that's IBIS. It's a lightweight Python library for data wrangling. We have a data frame API. It's in Python. We have interfaces to 15 uh, plus query engines. I think that means 16. Uh, uh, and we have a deferred execution model, which I will talk about uh, briefly. For any um, R people in the room, welcome. Um, this is a similar model to dplyr or dbplyr. Um, so what does this deferred execution thing look like? So again, we have a local and a remote. Uh, in this case, we've got a cool bird We're talking to Postgres. Um, we connect. We say, hey, I think you've got a table called ratings. But instead of slurping the whole thing down, we just say, please give me the schema of that table. I want to know the column names and the types. Then we can build an expression on the local side. We can validate this as we're building it. We can compile it into SQL. That is, we know you're not like comparing strings and integers. We know it's going to be, if not correct, at least valid. Send it back, execute it, pull the results back. Right? This has a couple of benefits. Um, for one thing, like the machine on the left could be a first-gen Raspberry Pi, and you're fine. Like the execution is happening on this huge beast on the right. And almost always, the thing on the right is closer to your data and also has a bigger pipe to where the data lives. Um, an interesting like, kind of thing that falls out of this is that in the same pattern, it does, you don't actually need to necessarily connect to the engine to do this. Like Maybe you have a metadata store that's separate. You just say, hey, what are the tables that the en engine has? Great, can I get the schema? Build up your query, then run it against it. Or maybe you don't want to connect at all. You just say, I know what the schema is. We write to this table every day. It's not changing. I'm just going to put it in here, write my query, and then I'll execute it when I need it. Um, one of the things that makes this possible to do in a non-infuriating way is that uh, IBIS validates expressions at construction time. So this is without executing. We can just look at, we know the schema. So if you say 5 greater than the letter A, we're going to error out and tell you that you can't compare strings and integers using like a greater than. Um, this doesn't guarantee that your query is going to do what you want it to do. It just guarantees that it'll execute. Like, so it's not, a, it's not a silver bullet, but it's, it's pretty good. Demo time. All right, we're here already. Let's see if this works. OK, that worked. That worked. Sweet. OK. So uh, I have an IPython terminal open here. I'm going to import IBIS. Can I zoom in, Philip? OK. OK, sweet. Hmm? Um, I don't know. We can, but it'll become very dark. That's OK. You guys know what I look like already, right? Yeah. All right. Ooh, I like this. OK. <laughs> Sweet. OK. So uh, I imported IBIS. You can't see my hand gestures, but maybe you can. Um, and I also imported this underscore thing. Uh, ignore that for now. I promise I'll tell you about it later. Um, and now I'm going to connect to a, a, like a local DuckDB database I have which has this IMDB data in it. So because it's a DuckDB database, I'm doing DuckDB.connect. It's a local file. Um, I can interact with this. And so now I want to say, like, hey, what tables live in this database? So I've got ratings and basics and principles. Sweet. So I want to grab out those tables. So for basics, I'll say, all right, give me that table. Um, I could also just use this like tables accessor. There's many ways to access things. Um, and if I look at these now, you'll see that it's not the table, it's the, uh, the schema, right, as the representation of it. And if I look at uh, ratings, same thing, um, you get the schema of the table. Um, I'm going to turn on, for the rest of this demo, interactive mode, which is going to eagerly execute things. So IBIS is lazy by its nature, but for a live demo, uh, lazy things don't work so great. 
Um, so now if I show you basics, you'll see just like sort of the uh, top 10 interesting rendering. I'll go up here. Top 10 uh, rows and same with ratings. So this is what the data looked like. Um, so let's uh, attack that first problem we had, right? So we've got ratings. The schema is not what we want, right? We want to kind of fix this up. So we might then say uh, select out this tconst thing and then say, okay, I'll take a new column called average ratings, which I'm going to reference using the table object I have, and I'm going to cast that to a float. And then I'm going to create another column called numvotes, uh, take that uh, numvotes thing and cast that to an int. Right? That works, right? So now you can see the types on top, they're what we expect. Um, and I'll save that into ratings so we have it for later. Um, just as a quick aside, I can just show you that if I were to then uh, show you the SQL for that, that's for DuckDB. But if I were to do it for SQLite, then you get what you need. Um, OK, now for basics, we've got this. Uh, we've got to do a little bit of filtering on this. So I only, I only care about movies. So I'm going to say that I want to uh, filter the title type of those just to movie. Um, actually, I'm going to do two filters. There's a family-friendly show, so we're going to take out the adult films. Uh, Basics.is adult equal to zero. Um, and then I'm going to select out of that just tconst and primary title. So I just want the title of the movies, but I only want movies, and I'm trying to leave out adult films. And that fails, um, because actually that uh, is adult column is typed as a string right now. Um, and so you can't compare integers and strings. So IBIS stops before it executes. It's just telling you you can't do that. So I'm just going to quickly go over here and wrap this in quotes instead. And now we have our basics. These are just the movies. Um, and the TCONs, we've filtered out all the adult films. And now we're ready to kind of put it all together. So we're going to do that. Then I would uh, take basics. And I would just join that to ratings on uh, tconst, and I'll just execute that quickly with just showing you like 10 rows. Um, and sweet, that works. Um, but like these don't look like the, uh, like the top 10 films on IMDb. Um, so I probably want to um, order by uh, the average rating. And here's this, um, uh, here's this underscore operator. Sorry, you probably can't see that. So here's this underscore operator. Uh, and what the underscore operator is, it's basically saying, I've just done this join, basics to ratings, and now it's sort of arbitrary about if I just say uh, average rating, what table I'm referring to or what object I'm referring to. The underscore is saying, I'm referring to the previous thing that I just chained off of. So it's saying the combined join of basics and ratings, that's, the, that's what I want to look at for this average rating thing. So now I've, just, I've sorted the average ratings. So I've got the top 10 films on IMDb. I don't recognize any of these, though. Maybe Ninja Moon Showdown. I think I remember that one. Um, but uh, realistically, I probably also need to then uh, filter the number of votes so that we're only looking at things that, say, have like more than a million ratings, because we don't need to weight things equally. Um, and that actually does look pretty good. I mean, I'm not sure that's exactly the top 10. They might be doing other stuff in there. But that looks like the top 10 uh, IMDb to me. So I'll call this Top Films. Um, and really quick, let me just turn off interactive mode, and I'll show you what that actually is. Oops, we need spell false, though. So if I look at this, you can see it fits pretty well, actually. We have these two tables, right? Because this is just this lazy expression. There's a ratings table, there's a basics table. I'm doing some selections, I'm doing some filtering on some predicates, I'm enjoying them, I'm ordering them, and then I'm filtering that again. And all this is saying is that if you have a table that has these columns with these types and another table with these columns and these types, and your engine supports these operations, we'll execute it. That's all that's happening when I say uh, con.execute top films, uh, limit equals 10. Don't want to burn through things. Right? That's all that's happening. What that means is then, for instance, if I were to connect to a local Postgres database, instead of DuckDB, and it also has type tables called ratings and basics, what a surprise, um, then I could use that Postgres connection and execute top films with a limit of 10 and get the same thing. Almost the same thing. I'm not sorting by the number of votes, too, so there's some slight variation there. Um, or it means that if I had like a uh, 
MySQL connection to a local MySQL database, um, and that had some tables called uh, basics and ratings, then I could similarly just execute that same expression with a limit of 10 and get the same results. MySQL is churning right now. Come on. You can do it. I believe in you. Yes. Okay. Um, and so that's what that looks like. Uh, and so this is just um, building up expressions in this lazy way. You can do it interactive or not. But then when you have the thing, uh, you're then capable of taking that and basically easily translating it to a different backend. Because all that you're sending over is SQL that's being generated that's specific to the backend you want to execute against. So as long as the data and the schema match, you can do this. OK, sweet. Um, if we could bring the lights up briefly, and then I will hand over to my colleague to show you some other stuff. Hey everyone, can you hear me? Yeah. All right, thanks Gil, uh, it was really great. I'm gonna take you guys through a few uh, advanced, uh, more advanced features of IBIS. Um, so let's say we have, let's pull up some of this, this data that we saw Gil kind of uh, alluding to there. Um, in this case, we've got some, some baseball statistics, we've got batting. I'm gonna turn on interactive mode here. We've got batting, we've got a bunch of stats, player ID, year ID, stint, league ID. Uh, th actually, those are the keys, and then we've got a bunch of stats, RBI, and so forth. Um, and let's say you wanted to normalize uh, all the numeric columns. Uh, it's kind of a funky problem in this case, because we've also got year ID and stint, which are also numeric, but you probably don't want to compute the z-score of, of, an I of a, a year. Um, so let's define a function called normalize, which is gonna subtract the mean and divide by the standard deviation of a column. And then we're actually going to say, we're gonna use the mutate API and we're gonna call this normed, uh, sorry, batting. Oops, typed it all out. So we've got, um, we've got this across uh, function which is a selector, which we sort of stole a lot of this nomenclature from the dplyr community, and a lot of the functionality in APIs are similar as well. And so the way that you can read this is, I'm gonna take the range of columns, uh, starting from the first one, going all the way up to league ID, uh, including league ID, and then we're gonna like logically negate that. So everything that doesn't match that column, and then, and then give me every numeric column, and then for the second argument of the cross, we're gonna apply this normalized function to all the columns that were selected. We're also gonna keep the original G column around because we're gonna muck around with that in a bit and we, don't, we, don't, we wanna be able to refer to the original values as well. Uh, need to import from IBIS uh, interactive. So this, this sort of turns on interactive mode, it imports like our examples module and adds underscore and the S uh, alias for the selectors module. It's just kind of a convenience when you're working interactively. Uh, so let's run that again. We've got normed, cool. <clears throat> we've, got, uh, we've got our normalized data here. Now I'm gonna assign an alias to this value. Uh, sorry, to this table, Let me clear the screen. And you might be asking yourself, why did he do that? <laughs> Let's say your colleague comes by and says, I don't care about IBIS, but I care about SQL. And also, IBIS doesn't have you know, the API that, that, uh, you know, that, uh, that I need to use. So let's compute uh, the percentile, or the, the median, directly uh, using SQL. And this is, this is a relatively new feature in IBIS. You can kind of just throw SQL at, uh, at, a, at an IBIS expression. Um, looks like I have 
maybe some incorrect code here. And basically what this, what this will do is sort of send this query to the database, get the schema, and then roll it into this kind of opaque IBIS blob that you can, that you can then, of course, just use as like another thing, right? And we've basically done a, a scalar aggregation, and so we've got that value. So let's actually, um, let's actually just add this in. Uh, let's maybe go a little bit more slowly. Um, so we want to replicate that, that median number, say, across every row, and then we're going to assign it. We're going to do a cross join, and then we're going to compute the median absolute deviation, again, using underscore, referring to the um, G column, and we're going to compute uh, let's see, I think actually this is uh, G, this is probably G, let's see, original. And then this is G med, and this is the absolute value. Let's see what happens there. Okay. So we've still got our original data as well. Um, and let's just see what we had in the original expression. Whoops. Sorry. Right, okay. That's actually, this is the original expression I had. We're actually going to compute the median absolute deviation, and then we're going to select, let me just clear the screen, and then we're going to select the first five columns again, and then we're going to select out a few of our previous columns that we computed. And again, we've got, we've got you know, our key columns, and we've got our, our computed columns. So that's cool. So we actually, so we've showed like sort of dot SQL, like you can just throw SQL that, executes against the back end, creates a new expression, and you can kind of continue on using Ives expressions. Um, now let's say we have, let's say uh, your, your colleague, another colleague comes along and says, hey, like, I don't like SQL, I don't like Ibis, I really like pandas. And I need you to like join this, this you know, median absolute deviation thing with like a pandas data frame. You being a person who is very interested in um, making sure that, uh, or a very adventurous person, you're like, cool, I've got, I've got that data set. Well, let me import pandas. Uh, it's PD, words players. We're going to read that CSV in, uh, and then we're going to kind of, I'll talk about why we need to do this replace uh, in a bit or uh, later. Um, but now we've got our data frame. Regular old pandas data frame. And with Ibis, you can kind of just transparently join that in. Like we just, I had our original Ibis expression. Like if we want to look at that, we can say uh, mad. And we've got this ugly select. Uh, I guess it kind of fits. Uh, there's a common table expression up at the top uh, that shows kind of the, the percentile computation. But uh, now if we look at MAD awards, if we sort of show the wrapper of that, we see that we actually did, we just handed a, a data frame to Ibis. We have Postgres on the left of the join, and we've got our join table here. Award ID, tie, and notes are all coming from, um, from the awards table. Um, so then another, uh, an, another colleague, I don't know why you as a, a person are having so many requests to do crazy things, but um, another colleague comes to you from the, from the data ops team and is like, hey, we did you a favor. I know you're using Postgres, but we put a bunch of useful data in MySQL, and now you have to use that uh, along with your original thing. And you're like, I've already done all this stuff in Postgres. What are you doing? So let's pull out the awards players table again, uh, but this time from a MySQL database. We've got the same data there. And we're just going to take that same expression, MAD awards, and join it mad, uh, with MAD. MAD is still coming from Postgres. I haven't sort of magically you know, introduced like a new variable and so forth that's in MySQL. It's still in Postgres on the left. On the right, we have MySQL. We constructed that expression. That, that doesn't mean it's necessarily going to work, but we have actually made that uh, possible. Um, this is something we're tinkering around with, very demoware, but um, pretty interesting feature uh, because we've now joined a Postgres table with a MySQL table right, right there, um, kind of very, very low effort. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, okay, that is the end of that demo. Let's go back to the slides and wrap this up. So Gil showed a bunch of these things, select filter, aggregate, join. Uh, I don't know if we hit aggregate, but it's in there somewhere. Um, can easily combine expressions, target multiple backends, joining tables across different databases. That's weird and very experimental. Um, please nobody put this into production. It's probably not great to run on your laptop either. Um, we support a lot of backends. Uh, generally, when people come to us with requests for new backends, we're pretty open to adding them. We recently added Snowflake, Trino. Um, Gil added our DuckDB backend a while back. That's really solid. A lot of these backends um, have, have pretty good support across all the, the IBIS uh, operations. There's our, there, of course, with any piece of software, there's always downsides. There's no golden tickets. Floating point math is a thing that you have to deal with. Uh, if you have a parallel execution engine that's doing a sum across the floating point column, things may end up looking different. Um, you can't use dot SQL on backends that don't accept SQL. Like, we're not going to magically run SQL on a data frame for you unless you're using DuckDB, because DuckDB does that. And then there's some backend differences that are um, very difficult to work around or, or like can't really be abstracted away feasibly. Um, Making RE2 regular expressions work with Perl regular expressions is not a thing that IBIS does for you. Overall, though, it will be less work, I think, re re than rewriting Pandas as some other kind of API. What's next? A bunch of things. Happy to talk about these running out of time, so I'm not going to go through them. Happy to take questions. These are all the places you can find us on the internet. Um, and these are the various Conda packages and ways to install IBIS. That is all. Thank you.